Okay, George. Well, uh, as he said, my name's George Sinos. Um, I gave a presentation, uh, I think two or three years ago, about how I ran my small switching layout with a uh, with car cards. Um, and uh, I've spent the last, it seems like a couple of years, but it's actually only been a few months uh, making the transition from car cards to JMRI's Operations Pro. Well, that didn't work. Hold on a second here. There we go. Um, this is more the story and a little bit of a demonstration is some of the features that I used that um, let me do at least as good a job uh, with uh, Operations Pro as I did with car cards and waybills. Um, I didn't really want to lose anything in the transition, and I knew there was a lot there to be learned, uh, but uh, but I didn't really realize how much, and there's there's much, much more. I'm really only scratching the surface, but for anybody that's considering it, um, I think it's it's worthy of taking the time to see if it's going to be useful to you. Uh, this is a list of all the links that are in this presentation, so um, I've given a copy of this uh, to Eric and he'll he'll post that up on the website. So if you think there's anything there that's worth looking at for you, you can download it um, and use it anytime you want. The two main resources that I think are really important are right at the top. And there are two, two videos by a couple of guys that I see um, at these presentations from time to time. And they really give you a great overview and a great way to get into uh, Operations Pro. And if you notice, I put the the timing of the two videos there, um, and that's a couple of hours. And this might sound a little bit harsh, but if you're thinking about getting into Operations Pro and you don't have a couple of hours to watch a couple of videos, you probably ought to not really consider it too much longer because you're going to spend a lot more time uh, actually doing the implementation on your own own railroad than you will doing these two videos. They're both very good and they both get you in quick um, or as quick as uh, it could possibly be. The documentation um, on the JMRI website if you're thinking that you're going to read that and figure out how to use Operations Pro, you got a pretty big job in front of you because it's not written as a tutorial. It is a reference manual. Basically, it's not exactly everything in alphabetical order, but it, you know, for the for the novice, it may as well be uh, because you're just reading things in the order that they show up on the screen. It's a great reference, but. Uh, but it's probably not the easiest way to learn. There's um, a fellow named David H that has some tutorials on his website and he uses the simulator, uh, uh, the railroad simulator trains uh, for all of the, uh, all of the examples. So, um, you know, that's a nice, that's a really nice way to watch him build the layout and then build uh, the uh, supporting operations pro stuff along with it and then there's a couple of printed examples down there too um and like i said back in 2020 i gave a presentation of how i use car cards with my switching layout so if you're at all interested in that there's the link back to uh to get a get a look at that uh, back in 2012 I had been out of model railroading for quite a while and uh, to get back into it and learn about DCC and JMRI and all the other stuff I had missed over the years. I built this small switching layout with the intention that I was going to build this, you know, giant thing down in the basement and after I'd learned about the new tools and techniques. But after I started using the small layout, I really didn't feel the need to build anything too much bigger. Um, a few years later, I added uh, this little yard, removable yard, excuse me, removable yard uh, off to the side, um, and uh, that that really added quite a bit to the operational capabilities there. And really, that's kind of uh, that's kind of the same place I am in now. I um, uh, basically. Um, 
want this to be for me and my grandkids and my friends to enjoy and uh, keep using as a platform for learning. And after all of these years, I may actually add a few structures and some scenery. At the beginning of this year, um, I added this extension along the back wall. Um, and I'll talk more about the functionality of that later, but it's just a 12 inch wide shelf that um, uh, has a little bit of the functionality moved off of this part of the layout over here so that this isn't so cluttered and there will eventually be more room for some scenery. So this is what it looks like now. Uh, this is my six-year-old grandson. Most of the time, if I have anybody else working with me, he's running the throttle and, uh, you know, he can't read yet, so he can't read the manifests, you know, but um, he... Uh, does a pretty good job with the proto throttle there. So as we sit now, the big L shaped thing is 15 feet long and about uh, just about a little over 10 feet in length. Um, it's 40 inches high and uh, it's all an end scale. Uh, I'd say it's a continuous switching operation because there's no staging of actual trains. You know, where we leave off is where we start the next time. The interchange traffic isn't typical staging where we have trains staged in one place and we'll set them up for the next um, operations um, session. Um, basically, cars uh, that come in and out of storage uh, just move into what I'm calling the, the interchange yard over here on this end. Um, so uh, they're not like placed in strategic spots around the layout. They just come from storage onto the interchange yard and go back to storage from there. So the way it's spread out now, um, I can pretty comfortably support two two-person crews, um, although most of the time it's just a, either myself or a single two-person crew. Uh, so there's a couple of pairs of Jeeps. Uh, you can see uh, we use the proto throttles uh, to operate. And since this whole thing is really supposed to emulate an industrial area. The top speed of all of those uh, locomotives is 10 scale miles an hour. So things are pretty slow speed operation. There's uh, an NCE command station that drives the whole works and a Raspberry Pi that runs all of the uh, JMRI software. I don't print anything out for manifests or anything like that. We use small tablets. Uh, for both the control panel and for uh, for viewing manifests. And if you look over my grandson's shoulder here, there's a little PC over here. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi itself is located on a low shelf underneath the layout. So this is just a more convenient way using uh, uh, VNC that echoes the keyboard and the screen of the Raspberry Pi, and it's just up here, makes it easier to get to without, uh, I'm, I'm getting up there in age and bending over isn't one of those things that comes naturally to me these days. Um, three of the industries are modeled after actual industries uh, in the Omaha area. And then uh, this seal test plan is actually at one time, there was an ice cream plant that was run by seal test. I don't know that they were ever, ever uh, rail served. It's pretty much uh, imaginary. And over here, there's a transload facility that uh, is uh, kind of a total fabrication, but it generates a lot of traffic. Um, the uh, Fairlight Plastics plant that was here at the front of the layout uh, that's already moved over to the extension. Everything else is there. The transload facility is moved from this end of the this end of the older part of the layout. It's physically moved over here, but I'm not through making the uh, changes to JMRI yet. That'll probably came in, come in the next couple of weeks. Once that's moved, I can take a couple of these tracks out of here because we'll only need to serve seal test and we can make more room for a much larger structure that'll look a little bit more realistic. And then also over here, we'll have room for uh, some sort of scenery, maybe a small neighborhood or something like that. Uh, here's those tablets that I'm talking about. Um, and I 
think I saw Steve Todd here tonight. Uh, his presentation that is shown in the beginning, uh, he talks about how to use JMRI without paper and gives you a lot of details on that. These are Amazon Fire tablets. Full price, they're usually $59. Um, but if you watch Amazon, they'll often put them on sale, especially, especially around the holidays, uh, down to about $30. And I've even seen refurbs that are like 20, as low as, as 20 bucks. So given uh, the 10 to 12 hours of runtime between charges, I can run for a week to two weeks without having to put them on a charger. Uh, also found on Amazon uh, are what are intended to be tablet stands uh, that sit on a desk or a table, but you can see I use a couple of them on each leg of the L uh, so that we don't have to carry those tablets around we can uh, just set them in the uh, set them in the tablet stand and uh, have adjustable angle here so that you can set them so they're easy to read. Um, I long time ago, I think even in the other presentation, I may have said that um, I use these little flashlights with plastic picks got, uh, taped to them for uncoupling. Um, I have uh uncorrected i have pretty horrible uh eyesight but with my glasses and when you uh shine a light on the reporting marks on an n scale uh n scale reporting mark it's pretty easy for me to eat, to read i don't have any uncoupling magnets or anything like that i just use these in a little twist they work just fine um the picks that you see there are micro brushes with the heads removed and they have a pretty nice point on them that lets you slip into uh, the gap between a couple of N-scale couplers. Um, operation sessions are one physical hour long and I use a four to one fast clock. The uh, fast clock comes uh, from JMRI and you can see it uh, shows on the screens of the proto throttles and it also shows on the screens of the uh, of the uh, 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 control panel. Now, just a little side issue here. Um, my layout was running just fine with uh, car cards. And um, I was curious about Operations Pro, but I didn't want to interrupt the operation um, of my physical layout just uh, during all the time that I was actually doing development. Uh, during all those years that I wasn't really doing any physical uh, model railroading, I had gone through several version of uh, RN's trains simulator and messed with it quite a bit. Um, so basically what I did was I converted the any rail drawing of my layout uh, through this program called Base Maps into a trains uh, layout. And I did all the development uh, for Ops Pro uh virtually uh through the train simulator and when i felt it was working out good enough then i started translating things to uh to the actual physical layout so why what what pushed me over the edge um i'm blaming a friend of mine harvey swanger and his lns railroad i think it was about 2016 uh he converted from card car cards to operations pro and um, after uh, operating on his layout a few times, I uh, I really liked it uh, for a number of reasons. Um, not that I did not like car cards. They, they are different and they both have different advantages. Um, the, the, with car cards, one of the things uh, that contributes to the flexibility is the only thing that car cards really define are your cars, your loads and your destinations. You can come up with any kind of process that you want to to drive those and um, run your railroad the way you want to run it. And all you have to do is look at a half a dozen different YouTube videos where somebody shows you how to use car cards. And if you find 20 videos, you'll find 20 different ways to use them. Um, the only uh, 
you know, one of the downsides and neither, neither one of them are very big downsides is when you're walking around and you've got a pretty good size, could pretty good size deck of cards. You know, if you, if you drop it, you're going to be playing pickup for a while to get yourself reorganized again. And in my case, um, there's a lot of clutter on the fascia with car cards and the room that my layout is in is also the shared TV room. And when I have visitors that are non-railroad visitors, you know, I try and keep it semi clean looking, even though I think even with, with whatever efforts I have, they may think I'm a little crazy with this great big train layout in the, in the TV room. Um, Operations Pro um, there's a lot to like about it, but everything really needs to be predefined and you need to do all of your planning and setup up front. And once you've got things figured out to run the way you want them, the between session set, uh, the maintenance actually is, is pretty small. Um, car cards, you know, in between sessions, you'll have to walk the layout, you'll flip the way bills, you know, where operations pro the way I've implemented it, where there's no actual staging, there really isn't anything to do in between, uh, for the most part in between sessions, uh, car cards, uh, on the other hand, you know, you hear guys talk about them being self healing. And if you've accidentally placed your car and its way bill in the same wrong place they're pretty pretty self-healing um however if you know one of your operators walks away with the card car car cards in his pocket you may be um you may be rewriting some new car cards in between sessions uh and again since it's unstructured changes can be pretty simple um for me rolling adding new rolling stock was time consuming but it was my own fault because I used to put a lot of details about the industry and the loads on the car cards, which really isn't total, isn't necessary at all. All you really need to do is put an identifier on there and tell it and write down where it's going to go next. Um, I spent way too much time uh, researching industries and putting that detail that probably nobody me ever read. Um, as opposed to the self-healing aspect of the car cards um if if you find a, a car that's in the wrong place or can't find a car that you're looking for with operations pro um you know maybe one of the issues is to put a missing car bulletin at the top of all of the uh switch lists or manifests so that all the crews can be on the lookout for it um the correct location for all the cars is in a table and you can either modify that to show where the car actually is and then jrmri will rewrite it to the to the place where it should be going or you can just put it in the correct place yourself so there's some differences there um and this is something you probably need to buy off on up front um if you're going to make changes they're more, they, they are more structured and they have to follow the rules of JMRI, which are pretty flexible, but you have to follow the rules and work within the way JMRI works. As opposed with car cards, you can pretty much use them any way you want. Um, adding rolling stock is pretty quick and I'll show an example of that a little bit later. Just very, very briefly here, how things used to work with car cards. I had all my different types of car cards in different bins and when i wanted to stage a new train let's say i was going to stage the uh, monday 7 a.m train for canco well this told me that i needed three box cars and i needed three um uh, three steel cars uh for that and i would go to those bins and i would pull those cards then I would go over to the uh, uh, what is now called the Council Bluffs yard. Uh, I would go to these drawers and I would pull those cars, and I would stage three cars at a time, uh, three trains at a time. I'd uh, put each of those trains with its associated cars into these drawers, 
And then when it was when I needed to run that train, I would manually bring it over to, I see I didn't label this, this is Seymour Yard on the old part of the layout. And then we would operate, the little switcher would run things back and forth. Uh, when the cycle was complete, uh, we would basically work it somewhat backwards almost. So how did this change? Well, two things kind of changed at the same time. I changed to Operations Pro and I also added the new extension. Um, so uh, rather than having a spreadsheet that told me how to go pick cards from a bin and uh, different types of cards, the, uh, the staging moves just operate as if they're another train. So uh, that sa same seven o'clock Monday morning job here, uh, says, go to these drawers, pick up these cars, and manually put them over here on the staging, on the staging yard. Okay, so rather than going to a drawer, then going oh, then going to the layout, they're just put directly. Since we have the new extension, just put them directly over here on uh, on the uh, interchange slash staging yard. Rather than rather than moving them later from the drawer to the layout, we actually run that as a job. Now this shows the short arrows here, but this is the train, the transfer train that actually goes the entire length of the layout over to Seymour Yard, uh, rather than just grabbing them out of the drawer and sticking them over here. So that's how life changed once we added the longer shelf. I'm going to take a little diversion here and uh, talk about uh, just some really, really basic terminology uh, inside of uh, Operations Pro. And I cannot stress how much I'm leaving out here. This is an overview of an overview of an over here overview. So in Operations Pro, for those of you that are totally unfamiliar with it, you define locations on your layout. Those locations are going to have tracks. That's where you're going to pick up and set out cars. And there's diff four different kinds of tracks that are used four different ways. One of the things that I would say is don't be misled by the fact in, for example, that a yard track is called a yard track. Doesn't necessarily need to be used in a yard. That just is a, tr a track that has certain types of characteristics. A spur track, for instance, will change an empty to a load or a load to an empty, where if you put that same car on a yard track, it'll just sit there until you move it somewhere else. You define routes that your trains follow from place to place, and then you define trains that follow those routes to the different locations and either set out or pick up cars from the different kinds of tracks. So spending a little bit more time on cars, okay? If you took all of your car cards and stacked them up, you'd have a good start on what the car table is. The car table keeps track of all the different pieces of rolling stock on your layout. It knows where they are. It knows if they're loaded and if they're loaded with what, other than just a generic load if you if you use if you use uh custom loads. It knows where the car is. It knows where it's going. And if it's in a train, it tells you that what train it's actually associated with. Uh, you can't quite see the title on this column, but every time a train moves, um, Operations Pro increments the counter to tell you how many times that car's moved. And that'll become important in a minute or two here. Um, if you look at the detail on any particular car, um, it looks like there's a whole lot of data to enter here. And that um, uh, that put me off for a while because I thought I was going to have to enter all of this data on 450 cars. Um, it actually isn't that bad. Um, most of it is just pull down menus and it goes pretty quick. And I think it probably helped quite a bit that uh, I had my cars sorted into different types from using car cards. Uh, but in the end, it only took about a week or 
or maybe seven or eight days, you know, uh, an hour a day, you know, to uh, get all the cars put in. Something I wish I would have paid attention to right from the beginning when you're talking about different types of cars, the dash is very important when you're naming something. Anything after a dash doesn't display on a manifest or a switch list. So on a switch list, all of these are going to be displayed as box cars, even though inside uh, of Operations Pro, they're all different and they all are able to pick up different kinds of um, different kinds of um, uh, loads uh, or go different places uh, based on what type of box car they are. Um, so in, you know, it, it would have been very useful and you'll see why a little bit later, you see some pretty convoluted uh, names that I used uh, for different car types to keep them unique. Um, uh, which isn't really a big deal because the, um, when you rename something in operations pro it ripples through the entire system so if you had 350 boxcar dash fruit and they really needed to be boxcar dash nuts you just go to find one of them and you rename them in that one place and that ripples through the whole system and uh it um uh, it's pretty easy now the the advice i'll give to anybody is don't go in there and re rename a whole bunch of stuff all at the same time. Rename one thing at a time. Make sure that worked out the way you thought it was going to work out. And then go rename something else after you've got things all tested out. Um, so again, here we go. Testing is strongly encouraged. Uh, similar uh, to naming different types of boxcars, this kind of works for most things. For instance, those uh, storage drawers that were originally named 24th Street Yard, I renamed that to Council Bluffs and that rippled through everywhere. And notice this little thing here, except in the comments and descriptions. So those have to be ma manually changed and I'm still finding all of those that haven't been changed yet. But eventually, I'll eventually get them all changed. So back to my layout. So the spreadsheet that I use to organize things, I don't need to use it anymore to tell me what kind of cars, uh, the uh, car cards that I need to draw or whatever. What I do need is I need some sort of a schedule to tell me when my trains are gonna run and, uh, and where they're gonna go. So um, all you see on here now, oh, by the way, this arrow here means you read columns down so you'd work all your monday trains and go on to your tuesday trains etc so what we have here are the heavy print the solid print here is uh, the name of that session and then these are the two trains that'll run in that session um, each one of these sessions like we said earlier lasts for fast hours or about one real hour. This one up here, uh, this is where I do the staging for everything that goes below it. So uh, when I when I stage these three trains, that will be enough to support all of the trains below it after I've run all these trains, which it's six hours if you hit, did a marathon session. I only run one hour at a time. That's about all I can stand up and uh, and still um, have knees that don't don't scream in the middle of the night. So you know it's like here we go. We'll run about three to five sessions a week. So the next time a staging uh, session comes along, probably is a week or two away before I stage stage the next batch of trains. Um, there's a feature that um, made this a little bit more convenient called automation in uh, uh, in Operations Pro. There's also something very similar in Dispatcher Pro, which helps you automate the running of trains. This isn't that. This is this is this is more to help you manage the generation of your trains and building of trains. Uh, Monday, for instance, in this uh, staging session, I would want to st stage these three trains. Without automation, I would walk over to my computer and hit the build button. 
And then the instructions for staging that train would show up on my tablet. After that was done, I would go back to the console and I would build the next session, do the same thing. And again, the same for the third train. With using the automation function, I can take all three of those and combine them into one staging session here for Monday morning. So that the details of that look like this. Basically, when I hit the run button on this action, it builds this first train and it shows up on my tablet. I go over and grab the six or eight cars for that and put them on the layout, hit the terminate button to tell the automation and I'm finished because it's sitting here waiting for me to hit that button. As Soon as I hit it, it goes on and it builds the second train. And again, when I'm done, I'll hit the terminate button and it'll automatically go build the third one. And I don't end up walking back and forth on the length of the length of the room to go back and hit buttons, you know, just to get the next, next, uh, next uh, staging uh, session kicked off. Um, that's a pretty simple, uh, almost trivial example. There's lots of commands in the automate in that automation facility that um, I have not begun to use, um, and I'd like to learn more about that. I think it could become more useful. Um, but the problem is because they use that same automation terminology in both Decoder Pro and in uh, Operations Pro. Uh, when you start doing searches to find more information, everything from Decoder Pro comes up, and it's uh, pretty tough to uh, I have yet to find any information on autom on uh, other than what's in uh, the actual instructions. So let's take a look at the uh, 7 a.m. Monday morning session. OK, so if I was going to do this operating session right here, um, we'll talk about this guy later because he'll come in. We've got two trains that actually run. We've already got everything staged for all of these uh, uh, subsequent operating sessions here. So this first train is the transfer train. He's the guy that picks up everything off the staging yard, drives all the way to the under end of the layout to Seymour Yard. And he drops those cars off and he looks over at the outbound uh, tracks on Seymour. And if he sees anything there, he'll run the pickup job and he'll haul those trains back uh, to the interchange to eventually get put away. When those cars arrive and they're ready um, uh, at Seymour Yard, then the uh, switching job can run. So the transfer job ends up looking something like this. Now, what I'm using here, what I normally use on my layout is the, um, is the tablets. Uh, what I'm using here, just for simplicity of putting the presentation together, uh, I could copy and paste real easy. I could copy um, one of the printed formats for um, uh, manifest. Uh, basically, this is what I said before. You, it's the the uh, transfer train. He's going to go over to uh, uh, the staging yard or the interchange yard uh, that I'm calling it now. And he sees he's got six box cars waiting for him. They're clean empties. They're not just plain old empties. They're clean empties. And he's going to haul those over to Seymour Yard, and he's going to leave those there. And when he gets there, he sees that um, there's four cars sitting on the outbound track. And he picks those up, and he hauls them back to uh, uh, the uh, outbound track uh, at the staging yard that's eventually going to uh, be moved to uh, those uh, storage drawers over in Council Bluffs. Um, once once uh, these guys are ready to go, we can actually let the other crew do the actual uh, canco. Uh, what are we calling this? We're doing canco uh, can job. Now, there's actually a roof here over these tracks that are inside the canco plant. These are outside, and everything underneath the yellow lines here are actually in the actual can plant. And this is where it looks like we have four spurs here. But in JMRA terminology, we actually have uh, one, two, three, 
for GMRI spurs because that's where we're going to turn loads to empties or empties to load. If we've brought some extra cars along and they're also delivered, but they don't have room for them in the plant to service them right away, they'll be sitting out here outside the plant on these tracks. And those are called yard tracks simply because they don't change the load to an empty or the empty to the load. They just sit there waiting until they can be placed inside the plant at, at their final destination, okay? Um, so you can see we've got one, two, three, four. Oh, these two yard tracks, that's the other point. Just because there's two actual tracks here, if I defined them as two yard tracks, GMRI would say place them on a place the cars on a specific track. However, um, I'm going to let the crew decide where they're going to put those extra cars. Okay, because when they're thinking ahead, they may want to put them on one track or the other. So this is just defined in GMRI as one big long yard track with the capacity of the total of these two. Um, so, you know, this is what the typical um, manifest looks like for this job. We've got uh, outside the plant, we've got a few extra empty gondolas sitting here. We've got this gondola inside the plant at the scrap dock that's full and needs to be picked up. And we have these two steel cars that have been unloaded and they need to be picked up. So here we are, pickups are on the left, on the right are set outs. And what you see here is we've got this brown gondola to pick up uh, and he's going to be replaced. See, we have this uh, black gondola that's going to be picked up from here and moved over to the scrap dock. And then we've got these two guys that'll be picked up. Once that's done, he'll drive back over to Seymour Yard and he'll drop those three cars off on the outbound track that will later be picked up by another transfer train. And then he'll pick up these clean empties that the previous transfer train brought, uh, brought him earlier that morning. And then he'll deliver those to the three tracks. And you can see one of those cars goes to the short dock, two of them go to the long dock. And then these three can just sit outside waiting their, their turn. Um, out of the box, the default loads are E for empty and L for load. And if you're happy with that, and a lot of people are, um, if you don't care about the details of loads, um, JRMRI has nothing in it that let, that requires you to use anything other than E and L for empties and loads. And it'll do its best to move those in between the buildings and, uh, or excuse me, in between the uh, industries uh, and on its various tracks the best it can. Um, if you want something that makes your manifests look a little more informative about what types of things may be going to industries, you can use what are called schedules and the custom loads. The custom loads are just the longer names of the actual loads, the schedule, is a list like this that gets attached to any particular track. So this short dock, okay, this short dock takes two different kinds of cars. It takes incoming box cars full of packaging material that need to be unloaded. And then it also takes box cars that are empty, clean empties to have palletized beverage cans loaded into them. OK, and then those eventually you'll get um, after their service, they'll end up going back to the council bluffs yard to figure out where they go from there. But we don't really need to worry about that at the moment. So these schedules work two different ways. You can have a sequential schedule that says, OK, I want these cars delivered in exactly the order that you see them on this list or they work in the match mode. Most of mine work in the match mode. Basically, 
I don't really care what order these are delivered in because what I'm looking for is a little bit of variety in my operating sessions. So eventually these will all get delivered, but um, they don't have to be delivered in order. So attached to the definition of this track, this spur track called the short dock is the package and can schedule, which has the list of things that I want picked up or delivered with these types of cars, okay? So if we go over to the Canco long dock over here, the 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 short dock can only take palletized um, cans because there's no um, conveyor mechanism to deliver unpalletized cans to anything waiting at this dock. This almost seems ridiculous, but I was an intern at the Continental Can Plant back in the 70s. And the first time I saw them manually loading cans into a boxcar, I was astounded. Um, but an awful lot of cans just get stacked up inside the boxcar. And they, after a few rows get put in there, they nail a big cardboard sheet in front of them so that so that they don't fall over. These are actually guys unloading cans at the other end. You can see they would, after he picks up cans with this little rake, he'd put them on this uh, little uh, ramp here and they would, they would fall down into the conveyor. If he were actually loading cans, cans would be coming from a conveyor above and falling down into here so that he could pick them up with his rake. So we've got two different kinds of cans that are going to get loaded here. We've got the can manual that I call these guys, and we've got the can forklift, okay, the ones that are loaded by forklift. So now we can talk about this concept of a wait time. These guys that are loading a car manually, it's going to take them longer than a guy that's going to use a forklift and load up, uh, load up a boxcar of palletized cans. So these cans that are loaded by a forklift, they have a wait time of zero, which means after this car is delivered, the next car or the next train that services that dock is going to pick up that uh, car as a load. The manual, the boxcar manual has a wait time of one, which means when when he gets delivered, don't pick him up with the next train. Skip one train. So it would it would be uh, twice as long before he would be picked up as opposed to this guy. The same thing here with uh, that I'm using with the uh, scrap. <coughs> Excuse me, the um, scrap gondolas. Um, they're just um, all variable. Even though it's the same car that's gonna get loaded with scrap and haul it away. Um, you can see the wait time is different for each of these each of these cars. This actually turned out to be too long. I decreased that to uh, um, decreased each one of those by two and I got much more pleasing results from that. And then the last one we'll take a look at here is the, uh, the steel dock. Uh, we have different kinds of cars uh, bringing in either coil steel excuse me coil coiled steel or uh sheet steel that's stacked on pallets uh this particular plant also had uh litho presses that um they would take after the steel had been cut into sheets they would print the can labels on the sheets um to be used here in omaha but also uh at other plants that around the country that didn't also have the printing, printing litho printing presses. So uh, the sheet steel comes in, the printed steel goes out. The coil steel, they just go out empty. Let's talk about these uh, reefers on a little bit of a different, this was, this was gonna be one of the test cases to decide whether I would use, uh, continue to use car cards and, unless I could, mimic this kind of operation. Um, over here, we have the seal test, uh, one end of the steel seal test plant. And he only has one spot uh, where he can spot a car 
uh, spot a refrigerator car to be loaded with ice cream and hauled away. But we don't want to bring one car at a time all the way from the staging yard. We want five cars at a craft to come in and uh, four of them would be put over here on this uh, this track waiting to be shifted in and out by the little switcher over here. And this turned out uh, to use a couple of facilities inside uh, of uh, Operations Pro to make that work. So just a quick look at the schedule here. You can see that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the uh, seal test reefers would come in on a transfer train and be delivered to, uh, well, initially be delivered to Seymour Yard, then uh, the uh, switcher would bring all five of them in. It would put four of them over here to wait and one over here. And then in subsequent um, switching sessions, uh, he would move one at a time as necessary um, uh, to uh, to get them all loaded. And eventually as other transfer trains um, serviced Seymour Yard, they would haul them back over to the interchange to be <clears throat> to be ultimately delivered to wherever the heck they were going. So how do you make this work? <coughs> oh, excuse me. There's a um, couple of features uh, that that get used together. Uh, this track over here is referred to as an alternate track. The name of it is Serv Service Yard 1 for no particular reason. And that's defined as an alternate to the loading dock over here. Without this facility over here um, of the alternate track, and you can see the percentage of custom loads generated by staging is 500%. Okay. So it says, Look over here when you're trying to fulfill this guy's uh, needs and then multiply his needs by 500%. So that's how I get from a loading dock that can only hold one car to five cars being delivered to here and then the excess being uh, loaded over on the uh, alternate track. This little checkbox says if this guy isn't, uh, this alternate track doesn't have enough capacity for a all your cars, um, just keep them back at Seymour Yard. That's what will happen if that's checked off. So you can see real quickly again, we get uh, five, uh, five cars delivered. One of them will go to the loading dock. Four of them will go to the excess over here. And we get one, one more uh, exchanged here, one more exchanged here, one more exchanged here, one more exchanged here. And we've got all four of these guys that have been moved through the system before the next transfer train comes in with some more empties. This one, um, I don't know if Dave Hussman's here tonight, but over the years, I've heard him say a number of times that, that uh, one of the weaknesses in JMRI is that it knows nothing about the standing order of cars. And that's true. And that comes into play here. Uh, you can designate a track as last in, first out, or first in, first out. Um, if these were all delivered at four different times, then either one of these would work because the delivery date and time is recorded every time you drop a car off at any particular location. Um, unfortunately, all four of these guys got delivered at the same time. So since JMRI doesn't know what order those cars are in and they're all delivered at the same time, somehow um, we've, we've got to somehow get across the JMRI that I want this one first, then I want this one, then I want this one, et cetera. So if you bring up the cars table that I talked about before. This is where that move count comes into play. Um, if I were doing this with car cards, what I would do is I would take the four car cards and I would put them in the order that I wanted them to be picked up and I would drop them in the little, little bin uh, at the front of the layout. But 
we have to just more or less simulate that moving using the move count. So uh, I, you know, I would at the end of the operation session after those cars have been delivered, I would jot down the order of the four cars, and then I would just change the move count so that um, they the move count would reflect the order that. Oops, sorry. The move count would reflect the uh, order that I want those cars delivered in. Um, surprisingly, that doesn't take but a minute or two. Moving on to the imaginary transload facility here. Um, one of the other uh, functions that I had used car cards for was to emulate this transload facility that has 13 different customers. We only have room for five cars on the unloading track. And then much like we have the alternate track here for the reefers, we have space for 13 more cars on these uh, alternate tracks for this track. Okay. And that kind of works the same way, but that doesn't solve how I define all 13 of those customers and have JMRI kind of uh, maybe somewhat randomly bring me cars from all those different 13 customers and, and get them into the system. Okay. So real quickly here, um, I will skip ahead to the point where the way you define all of those cars that um, or all of those tracks that physically share the same tracks is you put all their tracks in a pool. And this little status screen here uh, tells you who is currently sitting on that track and how much that pool that they're operating. And I talked enough about how I used the variable load times earlier. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is how you get back to storage. The way I used to do that was on the bottom of the car cards, I would say, what drawer does you have a little indicator here about which drawer this would go back into? So the same cars always went into the same drawers for storage. Using Manage Pro, or Operations Pro, um, I kind of um, defined each one of these drawers as a 1150 foot yard track. So that gets me uh, roughly 22 cars going into each one of these drawers. And the same thing, uh, just the opposite of what we did in the beginning is uh, we uh, have an imaginary train that picks up uh, the uh, any cars that are sitting on the outbound track in that uh, interchange or staging area, and then it delivers them to the individual drawers, which are the individual tracks. So um, I don't know where those cars are, but Operations Pro does. So when it tells me to go get something, it tells me what drawer to go get. So that's about it. Um, I went through those last few a little bit quicker, but um, I think the gist of it is there. It took about a year and a half, uh, maybe about two or three months of actual work spread over a year and a half. Um, it was interesting. It was a learning experience. It, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, I like the paperless version that doesn't have anything to do with Operations Pro other than um, uh, it works real well with the tablets. Restaging is quick and easy. Those mixed wait times really make a big difference. And it gets rid of a lot of that clutter on the on the front of the layout. So there we go. Um, one thing I will say, uh, Operations Pro itself can, can actually end up being a little hobby in itself. Um, and um, I subsequently found a number of other uh, guys on YouTube that use uh, train simulator software and they use Ops Pro to drive their operations. So I'll take a breath. And if there's time for any questions. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, I don't see any. There's just a comment in here about, can you use it? We were talking about the hyphen being a sort of a magic character. 
um, can you use something else? And the, it was answered in the chat that basically the hyphen is kind of the only special character. Um, yeah, but a, a colon will work fine if you needed to print that specifically. Yeah. So, or or anything else. I mean, you could probably use a slash. You could probably use a ha hashtag, uh, so on and so forth. So, I haven't found anything in the documentation, but like I say, I've probably read the documentation about fifty times, and I find something new every time. Yep. Every yep. time I go through there. So, Sorry, I rambled on so long. Oh, no, you're fine. And a lot of a lot of thank yous in the in the chat here. Um, if there are any questions, um, I will. Uh, uh, you can either type it in, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask, that's fine. I've I've re-enabled that. So, uh, but as always, thanks thanks for the presentation, George. We appreciate your time and putting that together. <laughs> Well, if it encourages anybody to give it a try. Yep. That's well, right. and it and and just just a reminder, how long is your layout? It's like 15 feet plus how much? <laughs> well, yeah, the long leg is 15 feet by 12 inches and the short leg is 10 feet by um about 18 inches. Yeah. Once again proving you can do operations on any size layout. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we talk about that all the time. People think operations is just for the, the big, massive empires. It's like, no, you can do it on anything. You just have to want to. So, yeah. And it definitely adds, I think it adds fun to the, to any railroad, but that's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of biased in that regard. So. <laughs> and you don't even need to build the layout. You can just, uh, no. No. you can just, uh, build it inside of your computer when the you know when the when the kids finally shuffle me off to an old folks home i can take my uh imaginary electronic version of my layout with oh me yeah the <laughs> there's there's so many good there's actually a lot of good model you know railroading simulators i mean i used to play one called transport tycoon and there's been so many over the years but uh I, I will keep playing trains even if I don't have the track. So, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. All right. I will stop.